we're glad to have you with us today. And if there is a, a question or something you would like to uh, know more about our family here at Lutheran Church of Our Savior, we'd love to be able to uh, <coughs> spend a few moments with you. After the service, we have coffee and some refreshments over straight across the hall, so please join us there. And uh, maybe we can get to know you a little bit better that way and you get to know us. We're glad to have you here today. Uh, a couple quick announcements. Well, one major one. Um, check out the table just behind the soundboard out in the lobby as you head out. There is uh, a little sheet that says save the date, and it has four different dates. One per month from Congregational Life, starting with one that you're going to have to sign up for just so we can get a head count. It's a 60th celebration, anniversary celebration of Lutheran Church of Our Savior from when we were incorporated as a congregation. We're having a pig roast, so uh, with all the fixings. So uh, sign up for that so we have a good number for that. That is September, Sunday, September 12th at 3 o'clock in the afternoon until about 6. So you'll have time to come to church, head home, grab your chairs, whatever, uh, and come back out and uh, we'll just have a great afternoon together celebrating. So uh, please mark your calendars and plan on joining us for that. We're going to talk a lot about food today. <laughs> huh? Because uh, our reading today is about the bread of life. And uh, there's a saying that goes, uh, that's the best thing since sliced bread. And uh, that phrase generally tells us that uh, something is uh, what we consider to be something that's needed, uh, convenient, and uh, advantageous to us. And that's how the crowds saw Jesus as well. He had provided bread for them, and they wanted more. They saw Jesus as the answer to their daily needs. Of course, Jesus is more than sliced bread. <laughs> In John chapter 6, Jesus declared that he's the bread of life. But as we talk about that, what does that mean? Does it have anything to do with what we pray for each time we say the Lord's Prayer and ask, give us this day our daily bread? Often I think we're a lot like the Israelites or the crowds today. We want things to be easy and convenient because we tend to think that Religion is something that helps us uh, to have better lives, for our lives to run smoother. But the truth is that living by faith, rather than just going through the motions of religion, often makes life far more difficult. Jesus offered himself to us freely, not to make life more convenient, but to fill it with grace, and purpose, and joy. Like those, that early crowd, we may have a hard time hearing the truth that Jesus tells us. But as we prepare to come before our God today, again in worship, I pray, I pray that uh, by the power of His Spirit in us, we hear the truth and we're filled with His fullness and grace. As we begin our worship, I invite you to stand as we sing our Lord. <laughs>
Heavenly Father, we come to you this day as your hungry children, hungry for you and for your word. Lord, through the power of the Holy Spirit, please feed us this day. For you are the bread of life. You alone are our very sustenance. As your dearly loved children, you are the very food that our souls long for because you are the bread of life. We pray that through your spirit, you would feed us now. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but that they had gone away alone. Then some boat from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Verily, truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they ask him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. But they ask him, what sign then will you give that we may see and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Verily, truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Having heard the good news of Jesus Christ, we confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. <clears throat> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we sing our hymn of preparation. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Help us to hear your words. Guide the thoughts of our hearts and the words of my mouth that they might be pleasing to you to produce in us abundant fruit for your kingdom. For we ask it in your holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> You may be expecting a sermon today about the bread of life, but by the way, we have three weeks of John chapter 6 that talks about the bread, and so we're going to be coming back to that throughout these three weeks. Today, I want to talk to you about something you probably don't want to talk about. Fire ants. Fire ants. They're small, but mighty. I don't know how much any of you know about them, but... They're probably one of the smallest insects, and, and while they're small, they can be a big pain, literally. If you've ever had the misfortune of being bitten by fire ants, you know that, for one thing, they don't stop after biting you just once. They keep on biting and biting and biting. And secondly, their bites don't just sting a little bit, they burn. They burn. They can even cause severe reactions in some people, like chills and shivering, cold sweats, and blisters that can last for weeks. My wife, by the way, is one of those who responds to their bites that way. And we found that out the hard way because a few years ago, for our 20th anniversary, we decided to do something big for each other. So we went on a cruise. And on cruises, as many of you probably know, they often offer excursions to different places. And uh, because we love animals, we tend to like to go to zoos a lot. And so we've been to a lot of zoos. And that, and so we were really excited when we got to Belize and found out that we could go on an excursion to the zoo. Well, it was quite the excursion. It was. Um, it, yeah. It, the Belize, the Belize Zoo is, uh, it stands out in our memories because it's, it's really small. It's out in the middle of nowhere. We pulled down a small dirt lane uh, after a 45 minute bus ride into a gravel parking lot and there was the zoo. Uh, really didn't have any amenities. And as we walked in, we started walking around and it looks like Wherever some animal happened to be that they could throw a fence around real quick, that's the zoo, okay? And then they had gravel paths in between. Uh, and that's probably uh, what gives us a little bit more memory of that because while we were walking around um, on one of those paths, not only did, here's another snake story, a snake dropped into one of the cages from the trees above, up above, um, but not only that, as we were walking around, we didn't notice that we all accidentally walked through a path of fire ants. Uh, it wasn't long before everybody was kind of itching and scratching, and, and uh, they were all over our feet and, and lower legs. Nasty, nasty little things. But they're not all bad. Um, because recently scientists have also discovered um, something that I think as followers of Jesus we could stand to learn from fire ants. You're probably wondering what that is, right? Well, the, the scientists discovered that fire ants can survive flash floods where many other animals can't. And they do it in a very unique way. When they're faced by this threat, somehow the fire ants all come together. They know it. They come together and are able to survive. Uh, and I know it sounds strange, but when enough of them come together, they, they cling to each other in such a way that, that, well, really, it can only be described like a little rat. You can 
Google this <laughs> and see the pictures of it. But they cling together so tightly that this raft uh, is strong enough that the rest of the colony can climb on top and they survive. And even though some of them are, are under the water, the way they bond together, little air bubbles are trapped there and they continue to breathe. And so they all survive until they float to some place of higher ground or the floodwaters recede. And in that way, they're all safe. It's amazing to see. They survive because of this tight bond they have with their neighbor. They use any means possible to make sure that they cling together and that nothing can separate them so that they survive. If you drop one red ant into water, it's going to drown. But if you drop enough of them in together, they live because of that interconnection that they form. And I think that's what we as Christians uh, can learn from fire ants. We're a lot like them. In Ephesians, Paul tells us what God wants his children's lives to be like. The problem is that the believers in Ephesus were living just like fire ants. They were biting each other. They were stinging each other and burning each other because they were divided over their backgrounds, over their race, over their ethnicity. Their infighting was causing harm to them and each other and tearing the body of Christ apart. And instead of fighting with each other and always looking at their differences, Paul says God wants them to have unity, to live purposely. They're to stop fighting and work together to carry out the mission that Jesus had given to all of his followers and witnesses of his love and mercy. Throughout Ephesians, Paul says God is calling them to live in a new relationship that he gives to them through baptism into Jesus. And in that one baptism, he says that they become one for the body of Christ. And God wants his children to live together in unity and peace and to be dependent and interconnected on him and each other because they're all brothers and sisters in Christ. You know what? That message isn't just for the Philippians. Unfortunately, as followers of Jesus, we struggle to live that way too. We easily see the divisions and the hatred and the ugliness that's happening in our world around us. That's easy to see, right? Just flip on the news. How can the world be like that? But the problem, I think, is that we as Christians, much like the rest of the world, lack the self-awareness to see that we're just like that, just like those fire ants. We bite, and we hurt, and we devour everyone around us, and we think that everything is just fine. You know what? That's why the world tends to not want anything to do with the church, with church people. That's why Gandhi can say, this Jesus I like, it's his followers that are just miserable. That's not a direct quote, but it's close. <laughs> See, we've been bad examples of Jesus to them. We claim to love Jesus and follow him, and yet we don't love others the way that he loves us or the way he loves them. We fail to see the hurt and the harm that comes from our judgmental words and our self-serving actions and what those impact or how those impact people around us. We stir up division and discontent when we gossip and talk among ourselves. We're selfish and we want our own ways. We want things that are familiar and comfortable to us at the expense of reaching others. We're discontent in life, and too many of us seem to think that complaining is a spiritual gift. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. 
that's not the way the body of Christ is supposed to live together. We've been called to be different. So we need to stop doing those things to ourselves, but also to stop listening to those who continue to sow division and discord among us. Instead, we're to speak the truth and love to each other, focusing on being reconciled to one another in Jesus so that we can be more loving and more caring to the people that God puts around us. As the body of Christ, those who claim to follow Jesus, were to be people that are bound together in love and humility as we share our brokenness together. We're to be people full of gentleness towards others as we realize that we all need grace. As the body of Christ, we deal with each other, or should deal with each other, patient, bearing with one another in love because we know that none of us is perfect. But we also all know that we're all dearly loved created in God's image. In other words, our lives together are to be about an interdependence on each other, about trusting one another, about being dependent on and depended on by each other. You know what? As we do that, you know what? We're going to make mistakes. We're going to hurt each other. But when we have that brought to our attention, we're to seek reconciliation with each other. We're to confess our sins to one another and seek forgiveness. And then, then we're to forgive. To have the grace to forgive one another as we've been forgiven. Our life in this body is about loving God above all else and then trusting Him. Trusting him by loving our neighbors enough to set ourselves and our wants and desires aside for their sake. As followers of Jesus, we're to be one, to be united in him, our Savior. And that unity in Jesus is to be lived out in all the storms of life that we face together. Our unity in Christ is about trusting God's promise that he will see us safely through anything and everything. It's about coming together as one to make those rafts. Those rafts of security that carry each other's burdens, that support and encourage and strengthen and comfort one another instead of just trying to do it alone or do it our own way as we're being built up together as one in the body of Christ, being held together in his love, as we're unified in our faith and knowledge of Jesus as Lord and Savior, we, he says, will mature into the fullness that God has intended for us. And while all of that may sound overwhelming, maybe even impossible, as his spirit dwells within us, he says, we have this promise that because our relationship with, with him is rooted and established in his love, we have power along with all of God's people to know how high and wide and deep his love is for us in Jesus. So that we can have confidence as we face the impossible that he can do immeasurably more we could ever ask or even imagine. That was that meeting from last week. And you know what? He doesn't leave us alone in that either. He himself has given us the gifts and the talents and each other and everything else that we need to be fully built up into the people he created us to be. So that the things of this life, as they try to toss us back and forth, as the storms of this world blow against us, we can stand together firmly in Jesus, our Lord and Savior, confidently that we can face everything together. 
is as who we are. We are God's dearly loved children, created to be one in Christ for one purpose. To live as his dearly loved children and to be his witnesses of his love. I pray that that is our goal each and every day. Amen. Amen. And now may the love of God guide, guard, and keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus and your life everlasting. Amen. Amen. We rise for prayer. <coughs> Father, we thank and praise you this day for all of the love, grace, and mercy that you so generously pour out on us. You are the bread of life, and we, we come to you because we have this, this deep hole within us and this hunger for your love and mercy. Fill us with that and help us to feast on you as we seek to love in your name. Equip us to do the good works that you prepared for us in advance. Father, all the blessings that you give us are to be used for your glory, and we thank and praise you for each and every one of them, including the country in which we live and the freedoms that we enjoy. Help us to use those freedoms for your good and for the furthering of your kingdom. Give us godly leaders who would seek humility and service to others above all else. Help us to have those same hearts, that we would seek unity with one another, that we would be content in all that you give us, that we would use those blessings to help those who are homeless, unemployed, hungry, lonely, or afraid. Father, be with us and strengthen us to stand up for those who are persecuted and oppressed. Father, we thank and praise you once again for all things. We thank and praise you for the confidence that we can come before you to list and name all those that are on our heart who are struggling with cancer, COVID, or other diseases of body, mind, and spirit, especially Melanie Bradley and all others that we name before you now. Father, you know all those that are on our hearts and minds, and we pray that you would be with them and their families. Strengthen them through these times of trials. Heal them according to your good and gracious will, but most of all, remind them that you are with them always and will never leave them or forsake them because you love them. Love them so much that you came down and gave your life for them. Father, we thank and praise you for that promise. We lift up those who mourn today. Be with them. Surround them with your love and care. Be with all those, Lord, celebrating their birthdays this week. For Judy, Jean, William, Maggie, Lawrence, Christine, Tom, Art, and Dottie. We also ask that you be with Chuck and Diane Gilfeld. Lisa and Ron Kelshaw as they celebrate their anniversaries this week. We thank you for the gifts of life and love and pray that we would use those gifts to your glory. That in all of our relationships with each and every day that you give us, your love, grace, and mercy might be experienced. That others might see our, the way we interact with each other and forgive one another that they too would come to know you as their Lord and Savior. Gracious Father, confident of your love, we place all in our prayers, all else that you know we need, as well as all of our loved ones, before your throne of grace, trusting in your mercy. Through the strong and sure name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ loves us so much that he comes to us as the bread of life. Something of sustenance that we all need. That's why on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood, the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Remembering his death and his resurrection, ascension. We can await his coming again in glory. In the meantime, we live in peace, his peace. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And, and also, also with you.
Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith and the life everlasting. Go in his peace. Amen. Amen.
where you please head to the outside aisles. And as you head to the back, please take everything with you. There's an offering plate, uh, recycle bin, and trash can as well. Go in peace to love and serve our risen Lord. Thanks be to God.